I tried your way, Charles. I tried to be like them, live like them, but it always ends the same way. They took everything away from me. Now, we'll take everything from them. Is that an X-Men movie? Yes. Okay. Uh, how about Days of Future Past? The best one. Not the correct movie, no. Okay. How about the worst one? X-Men 3 United. X-Men United. That's... Both of those statements you have said are incorrect, but... Um... <laughs> <laughs> um, Dark Phoenix is the worst. Um, debatable. One A, one B at being the worst. <laughs> All right. So, is this an original trilogy or a seek or a, 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 a the reboot trilogy? Or... It is. It is none of the three movies we have mentioned so far. Okay. Is it X Men Two? No. Is it X Men? No. <laughs> is it? It's Apocalypse. Is it really? It's one of the worst. It's one of the worst ones. No. But it's a great film. That movie's fun. Um. That movie is a you know, massive step down after Days of Future Past. Ah. Uh, I guess that's okay. I can, Even I can, though I can it, swallow with that, it it does use uh, Four Horse by Metallica, and that's pretty dope. Okay. Um, I actually had Apocalypse on in my mind early on, but I remember you disliking that so much that I put it back to the bottom, which was Doom. <laughs> To the Average Joe's Movie Clubcast. This is Justin. And I'm Joey. Tonight we are once again letting it rip with some more Aka Fun as we follow up our uh, introduction with the Bellas from last episode with the sequel, Pitch Perfect 2. Plus, we're getting in touch with nature with a Kurosawa character, a, Kur a, Kur a, a, a Kira Kurosawa character that, in my personal opinion, feels a lot like Yoda. With Dursu Alzala from 1975. I, I don't think you're the only one, friend. That's not even the biggest Star Wars thing in that movie. Oh, yeah? But we'll get there. Okay. We'll, we'll get there. I'm curious. It's the one scene. It's, it's, a, it's a scene. Just <laughs> a shot. Oh, oh, the sun. Um, gotcha. Just a heads up, we yeah. do discuss our full thoughts on these movies, so if you have not seen it, um, you know, listen to a bit of our conversation, go check it out if it sounds interesting, or hey, maybe you'll forget about it like I did with one of these. And if you want to be a part of the club, make sure to hit that subscribe button, leave us a comment, because we would love to hear from you. Well, Joey, when it rains, it pours, and life's been pretty freaking wacky the last uh, month or so i've barely watched any movies i've mostly watched like the big bang theory and young sheldon um 
I guess it was mostly because one of those shows. Have you ever seen uh, Young Sheldon? I have. I mean, I've seen like pieces here and there. You know, mm-hmm. like being on TV or you know when you're somewhere and TV's on or whatever. Like I wouldn't have any issue with watching it, mm-hmm. but. Like, I have shows that I like that have finished or have a season or two that I need to watch and I haven't caught back up on, so... But I say that, um, I also haven't watched as many... I've watched more movies than the last time we did this, but the six seasons of True Blood that I have watched recently has... um... Did you finish it? Yeah. No, there's one season left. Oh, God, just don't watch Uh, it. It's not worth it. I mean, I've... I've watched it all before a long time ago, and I, I, when the show came out, I had read all of the books that had existed at that point, um, you know, many years ago. Um, But yeah, no, season season six was, boy, is it out there. And I remember, I don't really remember anything from season seven other than it was like, man, this is really out there. So. I yeah. remember seeing the the cliffhanger for the following season. It's some kind of like vampire invasion about to go on, and yeah, that movie was really good with the cliffhangers. But um, yeah, that oh that yeah, last Every, everything was a, was a well when they 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 stayed fairly truthful through the books for the first couple of seasons. Some some changes here and there, like you know, some some stuff for TV and what have you. But then they just kind of went off of their own path and uh yeah it the books were out there the tv show even not having elvis as a mentally challenged vampire like they do in the books it just it went off the rails (laughs) yeah i was a counselor at scout camp for a week so yeah i kind of stayed away from the movies just so i could like like basically just kind of rest up for that slash like write the curriculum for what i was gonna be teaching the following day so that was very busy and exhausting, but um, seen a few movies in there, but yeah, so we had like this really, really bad thunderstorm here, which turned into, I guess, a microburst. It kind of seemed like a tornado. I don't know. There was a lot, a lot of destruction here in the um, Ladson, Somerville area of uh, South Carolina, but um, yeah, lost a f- uh, couple trees. Uh, the tops snapped in our backyard, creating widow makers, so I uh, had to spend a uh, pretty penny getting those chopped down, and just found out that my shower drain's leaking, so I have a hole in my ceiling and dealing with that nonsense. And our AC is getting old, so therefore it's not cooling the house as well as it should. And it's 100 freaking degrees outside, so that sucks. And um, yeah, life's really expensive, especially when stuff stops working. Yeah, that is one of the. Um, I guess that's one of the benefits and quotation marks of of at least renting like Mm -hmm. you know that shit breaks ain't on me to fix it but still so wow uh, let's talk a little bit more yeah yeah oh go ahead i was gonna say but yeah everything in life is expensive right now like i went to the grocery store and got like today and got like milk bread uh, deodorant and mouthwash and it was like 50 fucking dollars and I was like what the fuck <laughs> so yeah <laughs> yeah that was amusing we were uh, chatting back and forth earlier today and I was like oh I'm anxiously waiting this Amazon package it's a uh, I've heard that uh, electric fly swatters um, these things look like basically tennis rackets and they they're metal and you push a little button and yeah the uh, the flies uh basically blow up in a little static uh burst of electric excitement and um it's quite satisfying so i kind of want to see more flies around so i can go to fucking town on those things um just take out take out your aggression on the flies (laughs) yeah um and then you said oh well my my amazon is typically mouthwash and shampoo and i was like oh well that's quaint yeah like I (laughs) i don't order a ton from amazon right now but yeah like so the the mouthwash i i get special like i don't just get the like oh here's the cheapest bottle i have to get like ones designed to care for my gums and it's like nine dollars a fucking bottle but you can get it on amazon and like a two-pack for like i don't know 14 or 15 dollars like it's not a huge savings Mm -hmm. but it also prevents me from having to go into walmart because if i go to like food line to get it it's like 
10 or $11. And then like to get the deodorant I like, it is only at Walmart and Walmart didn't have it. So I had to get like my backup. So yes, um, <laughs> lately it has been to order that kind of shit. The, the, I think the last one was a new shower curtain, new bath mats and shampoo. So, <laughs> um, yeah, you know, adult shit, a fun, fun adult shit. But like I was telling you, the criterion cell is coming. I've got those gift cards. I'm, I'm getting something. Damn it. What? I don't know yet, but, I'm getting something. Oh gosh, remember when we used to go on and on about Criterions on this show? I mean, <laughs> yeah, I do. I we we do have a couple of old episodes actually detailing our Criterion collections. Mm-hmm. Um, Hasn't grown much since then maybe for some, me. Maybe <laughs> mine has grown some, but not a ton. I mean, I've also branched out and gotten some other boutique stuff. Um, since then probably um because it's been a couple of years like i think the last thing i got was uh umbrellas uh, uh inside that french horror movie that we watched a couple of years ago yeah i got a nice copy of that um oh, cool. the end of last year that's like the last movie i bought at all um so yeah but they came out with, uh, with fear and loathing in uh in 4k i might have to pick that up anatomy of a falls good they not sure look- if i'd want to own it i think it's on I think it's on. Is that a Netflix one? I don't know. I don't know. Peeping I don't Tom. Know. I don't have Netflix anymore, so. At least until next year, and then I'll have to get Ooh. Netflix, but that's a different story. I'd probably buy I Am Cuba. That's a good one. Um, they came out with a new version of La Haine. Cool. These are all the recent releases. Yeah, I remember when I used to, like, be on bated breath on, like, the 15th of each month like waiting for like what would be the new criterions and now i'm like oh it's the 20th cool all right moving on <laughs> have you ever heard of happiness by uh todd salon no but to be so, fair there's a lot of movies in the criterion collection i haven't heard of but you know i either read the description or you know see what people say and try to go from there um it just it, it just like depends one of the most sexually awkward movies ever so hey maybe we'll dive into happiness someday oh re-release of, oh yeah risky business that'll be fun um now that it's on criterion gotta rewatch that oh risky business oh well now now it is a masterpiece <laughs> <laughs> Calm down, Star Lord. Uh, <laughs> I uh But it's funny, I've been doing that same thing to people recently. <laughs> I just reeled up a, a big uh, F you to Joey since uh I'm simply talking about movies and anywho. So I was like, alright, speaking of movies, let's talk about what we've been watching lately with the good, bad, and the ugly. Um so I was really paranoid about you like bl- hiding up, hiding what these were, and then I went and like didn't even do it since I was. I pretty much wrote the wrote my part of the show in a fraction of the time I usually do. But anyways, all right, let me just run through these, and maybe we can change it up a little bit here. So my good is Speed. Yeah, Dennis Hopper, uh, Keanu Reeves, Pop Quiz, Hot Shots. There's a bomb on the bus. What do you do? Yeah, this movie is. A lot, a lot, a lot of fun. A lot of like iconic moments and very thrilling with the with a very um, intense music. Um, some cheesy spots. I mean, obviously, if a you're driving a bus, it wouldn't like propel itself upward whenever it's going over a uh, bridge. And um, yeah, some cheesy ninety action moments. But for the most part, this movie is hundred percent badass and one hundred percent a good time. Um, it's been a long long time since i have seen seen speed but i fucking loved that movie when i was younger um and i would love to like go back and uh re-watch that i why couldn't you have picked uh, not not against necessarily saying this why didn't you pick speed over dursu because dursu was great but like man why couldn't you have picked speed and we could have watched that for the podcast <laughs> also 
I was thinking about the the second one you've got here. I was, uh, which you'll say in a second, I was actually thinking about picking that probably soon, but I guess I won't. <laughs> oh, no. That would have been cool. Um, back to Speed, I uh, was watching with my son, and like the, the, intro, the intro credits are kind of hella long with like how it's like this elevator um, kind of going up and flashing the credits with the awesome music. He's just like, gosh, this is taking forever. But I'm like, oh, but it sets up. You know where we're going with this being a hostage situation on an elevator. It's, it's very good. All right, so uh, it's not bad, but it's badass. I saw a Gladiator the other day. My uh, nephew picked that out of my pile of a dude movies to watch and started this bad boy pretty late, and that did not matter one bit because I was pretty much glued to uh, Gladiator this time. It had been several years since I'd seen this. The 4K looked great, sounded great. Oh, wait a minute, it wasn't a 4K. My son put the Blu-ray in instead. Wah, wah. But, you know, still oh, good enough. Oh, no! You fucking peasant watching a movie in 1080p. Oh, my God. <laughs> Gosh, you just want me to flick you off all over the place tonight. Jeez, Louise. Um, Yeah. So, great, great Shakespearean tragic drama in this. Uh, Commodus is very, uh, yeah, um, Joaquin Phoenix, great in that role as, uh, you know, he's pretty pissed that his, uh, the Caesar dad is like, eh, yeah, yeah, your birthright's not important. I'm just going to give it to this badass leader of the army, which um, they have an awesome scene against the uh, dramatic hordes. The classic lines like, at my mark, unleash hell, and... What we do in uh, Life Brothers echoes in eternity. And are you not entertained? So many good stuff. Well, probably, probably one of Ridley that, Scott's no, best. Mm -hmm. all, um, also with uh, I am Marcus Aurelia, Aurelius mm -hmm. of this and this, you know, leader of the army. That that whole thing is pretty fucking dope too. I will have my vengeance. And yes, this is yes. Um. I did notice this time stylistically there's a lot of like sped up motion at times it's it's kind of snuck in there but if you're looking for or if you, you notice it it's 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 like eh did you realize to do that really Scott but otherwise I think the cinematography is great it's funny if you ever go back to the Siskel and Ebert um, episode on YouTube about this um, like Ebert like totally hated this movie thought it was like really it was like too dark and it's nutty but yeah one best picture so because that means everything it's, Q, uh, smart ass comment from Joey. Um, no, you were trying to bait that one out, so uh, I let you uh... <laughs> uh, linger in my non satisfaction. We'll go with that. Um, yeah, had a good time kind of breaking down the plot because, um, you know, my boys are kind of a little bored in the scenes where, you know, they're just chatting, but gosh, this movie just kind of flies by and really sets up all the characters pretty well and the, each uh, gladiator fight is increasingly awesome the last one not as much but i mean i kind of got into more of that drama between you know maximus like clinging to life as he's yearning for his family in the elysian fields of you know the, the afterlife and uh gladiator good time and my ugly so joey warned me that there's this little movie called Jason Goes to Hell and it's a pile of shit. But I was like, but I was thinking back to young little Justin back in 1993 saying, oh wow, look at that movie poster with the Jason mask and the fire and the snake thing. What the hell is that snake thing? Oh God. Jason Goes to Hell finally saw it and it is nothing like what you'd want it to be. It's, um, go ahead, Jay. you have something to say. Go for it, bro. Oh, man. So, first of all, this is such a piece of shit movie. They wasted such a cool-ass name. Jason Goes to Hell. And then... They wasted that fucking amazing ending where Freddy's claw comes up out and pulls oh, yeah. the mask down. Mm -hmm. Like, I... Fuck... Okay, I love anything that's a fucking crossover. I had all... Um, I don't think I had seen Freddy versus Jason because I was going through through them chronologically that all started because of our very first Halloween special um, where we watched the fourth Jason movie or the fifth Jason movie. I don't know. One of them. 
the final chapter that is not the final chapter. But um, yeah, that ending scene I fucking marked out so hard. But the whole rest of that movie is such a piece of shit. And we all, we all, we all told you on your on Letterbox like that movie is real bad. <laughs> yes. So um, you would think that a, a really cool scene of like all these like SWAT guys moving in on Jason and putting all the lights on him and blasting him to hell. That would be the end of the movie. Were they blasting to hell? No, 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 no. That's the beginning of the movie. Jason is not in 90% of this movie, unfortunately. Maybe the back of him in a mirror shot because this is a fucking vampire movie, apparently. Um, Yeah, so in the last couple... like Because one of the movies before this, like, Jason was in a grave and, like, the electricity came down and reanimated him. Yeah, fun, whatever. But, no, this, like, drags that out to the painful extreme where everybody else kind of, like, animates as Jason and looks like Jason in the mirror, like I had said. But, yeah, you're just not getting any of the satisfaction of caring anything about this, uh, you know, Jason slaughtering people because it's not actually Jason. It's a bunch of random people. They throw a bunch of the family bullshit in here, theology or mythology about like you can only a Voorhees can kill Jason and only a Voorhees can reanimate Jason. So all that's bullshit. And then, yeah, this ending is t- 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 terrible with um, the special effects. Like all of a sudden Jason turns into a Roman candle as like these little red flares pop out of him randomly. And oh, yeah, because god sending him to hell because there's this beam of light coming to heaven you know down into the earth and then jason gets pulled down by sand monsters because that's real demonic this movie blows yeah have you had did, have you watched x yet not yet maybe tonight we'll see oh. <laughs> all right i can't wait to see your review on that shit all right, well, that's yours three. Um, so I guess I'll just uh, um, I'll do mine. Um, I actually came up with some 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 names. I have the baby Baba Yaga. Uh, what a disappointment! And moving on up. So I guess I'll just read them down. So, baby Baba Baba Yaga. Y'all know who the Baba Yaga is, right? Mister John Wick. Oh, Keanu okay. Reeves. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so this is a, uh, I have this box set that I bought at uh, the pawn shop, and it's a bunch of martial arts movies, and then this movie called Brotherhood of Justice, which stars um, a very young Keanu Reeves, a very young Kiefer Sutherland, and a very young Lori Laughlin, a.k.a. Aunt Becky from Full House, um, and a very young Billy Zane. Um, and it's uh, basically... Uh, they're in a high school. Keanu Reeves is the really cool guy. He's dating Lori Laughlin. He's the quarterback. He comes from money. The The whole high school is mostly well-to-do. The town is mostly well-to-do, except for the, the poor parts, which are minorities. The school keeps getting trashed, and the principal tells them they kind of have to take it back. And this group decides that they're going to form a group called the Brotherhood of Justice, start doing a bunch of vigilante shit. But then it starts going from like, oh, we're taking down drug dealers to we just don't like these people. And it it ends with them um, Molotov cocktailing a dude's car and putting a pipe bomb under the under the fender of uh, Kiefer Sutherland's car. And Keanu at this point is like, hey, I'm not with this shit. And he stops the bomb from going off and then like goes to the cops and the movie ends. And then in the, the credits, it shows everybody getting arrested. But come to find out. This was based on a real story about some shit that actually happened in Texas, except for the Brotherhood of Justice, where all white guys, and instead of their symbol being a red hand, it was a swastika, and they just fucked up minorities, and only got stopped once they started fucking with white people. So, that's a movie. Um, Wow. Wow. It had some, you know, some cool ideas and, you know, trying to deal with, you know, differences and, uh, you know, Brotherhood of Justice. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Um, You know, trying to, you know, kind of deal with uh, different stations in life, um, social classes and economics and minorities and race and all of that. But, you know, it wasn't super fleshed out. How did this uh, how this movie come to come to your attention? 
because I had bought this box set of martial arts movies and it was oh, on it. Okay. okay. So yeah, so they 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 use this to market. So they they put some movie with Brandon Lee in it that we've watched before that was really bad. It was funny. And then they put this movie because they could say that it had Keanu and Kiefer. And then there's a okay, a, a Chuck Norris movie. And then all the rest of it is shit I had never heard of. But which is fine because whatever is all kung fu like Chinese kung fu movies. I'm here for it. Um, so what a disappointment. Oh. Um, so I had to get to be able to watch this movie. I got a free uh, to to watch Dursu for the podcast. I got a free trial. To Criterion channel uh, which you can get for seven days and one of the movies in the leaving at the end of the month was a movie called After Dark um, which I have wanted to see for a hot minute it's a vampire movie directed by ne- Catherine Bigelow it's not near dark uh, ne- did I say yeah near dark okay it's like after dark that doesn't sound right <laughs> yeah near dark sorry my bad so yeah near dark um, directed by the same person, the same lady who directed Point Break. Mm-hmm. Boy, howdy. As someone who has read a lot of vampire books, watched a lot of vampire shows, vampire movies. This ain't it? This this ain't it, Chief. Um, so did you know that um, to cure vampirism, all you need is a blood transfusion? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which makes no goddamn sense because all they do is drink blood all the time. Also, (laughs) usually vampires have a good sense of when the sun's coming up. These motherfuckers, no fucking clue. They're always like, oh my, that or they have the worst time management skills ever. (laughs) Why are they doing everything like two hours before the sun comes up? What the fuck? The only good thing about this movie was Bill Paxton. And he's the guy on the cover with his face. He's not even the main character of the movie, but he's oh, the he... best part of the movie. Without oh, him, I had no idea that this was him. Movie, this, without him, this movie is the literal shits. It's still the shits, but it, it's bad. It was such a disappointment. Like, I wasn't expecting fucking interview the vampire or anything like that, but goddamn, like, this was a disappointment. Um, was, so I would. Have, have you seen Lost Boys? How's it compared to that? I have seen Lost Boys. Um, so it's been a long time since I've seen Lost Boys. Um, I have. I, Lost Boys within my part of my friend group has a mythical place, but nothing to do with the movie itself per se. But um, hmm. it's been a long time, so it be it wouldn't be a fair comparison, but. Lost Boys is like fucking Citizen Kane compared to uh, Near Dark. Wow. Um, so we, we have talked about on this uh, on this podcast about what Mean Girls is for me, right? That's So I have a buddy that yep. is t- for him. And, and he is, I don't know, five, six, seven years-ish older than me, somewhere in that ballpark. He's one of the really old magic head not really old but the older magic heads and for him that movie is lost boys okay. um so it has like this mythical place with certain friends in my friend group um because of that all right the last one moving on up this okay. is a movie called babyface from 1933 oh, okay. um Yes. I wonder if I've seen um, that. I believe you've seen this movie. I believe you have seen this. Okay. It sounds familiar. Maybe a long time ago. Um, it's about the chick who uh, basically literally and figuratively sleeps her way to the top of this bank. Oh. Um, that doesn't sound familiar at all. Um. Well, obviously they don't show anything because it's the 30s, but it's um, this was one of the last movies... Like it that helped bring him, and they brought in the Hayes Code afterwards. But yeah, this girl um, decides that that she, how she wants to get everything in life, and she just kind of goes up the rung at the ladder and keeps getting money and keeps breaking these guys' hearts. And um, it was it was very entertaining. Honestly, it was on Tubi, so like it's free to watch if you. uh, I mean, 
if you have the internet. Um, so it's it's definitely worth checking out. Like there was there was guns and suicide and a lot of implied sex and you know so for like 1933 it was very risque. But um, I thought it was I thought it was a, a fun watch. It was definitely worth watching. I saw that back in 2009 as part of me and uh, Adam's little movie club. Okay, yeah. Uh, the way you were talking about it made it sound a lot like The Apartment, but um, yeah, I can kind of see in my review how I was kind of thinking the same same stuff. Neat. Gosh, starting to... After seven years of writing all these reviews, it's starting Two, to... stuff starting to fade 2009? fast. 2009? You mean 2019? That's correct, because 2009 would not be in the... That would be the pre... Pre-Litter Box era. You kind of look like I Dursi right now. You know, <laughs> I, just to say, I didn't think you had uh, knew uh, Adam back then. <laughs> All right, let's get into these feature movies. So first up, we got Pitch Perfect 2 is a 2015 American jukebox musical comedy film. <laughs> I didn't know jukebox was a... Uh, a, gen- a genre but um i like it i like it it makes a lot yes, of sense I, I, same I, I i guess yeah i guess because you know just plays a bunch of music like a fucking jukebox yep directed and produced by elizabeth banks in her feature directorial debut and written by Kay cannon the film centers on the fictional barden university bellas an all-female acapella singing group who try to beat out a competing German musical group in the World Acapella Championship in uh, Denmark. DSM. DSM. <laughs> DSM. Uh, DSM. It's it's against my... Okay, so I can't really read this first fact because I'll, 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 you should I'll do that. For you. Thank you. I don't want to toxify my mouth. So the owner of the Chicago Bears, the Green Bay Packers. <laughs> oh wait, I'm sorry. That's just Aaron Rodgers. Yeah. Um, the Green Bay Packers got the chance to appear in this film after offensive lineman David Bakhtiari. Bakhtiari. Yeah, it's Bakhtiari. Bakhtiari. Mm-hmm. Sent a tweet to director Elizabeth Banks telling her they were big fans of the first Pitch Perfect and would love to appear in a sequel. And you do get them, Clay Matthews especially. Um, mm-hmm. Probably the biggest Packer they could have gotten in 2012 that wasn't named Aaron Rodgers. I'm guessing. I gosh, that's like yeah, the, dis- so, the discount double check d- double check days. Speaking of old commercials. Oh boy! Yeah. The Pentatonix appeared every- as the Canadian group during uh, the World Championship. I re I re flicked through it and I still didn't notice that. Go ahead. Uh, I mean, I guess to be fair, I mean, I don't. You, Pentatonics could walk into my room right now with a giant sign that says "We are Pentatonics," and I wouldn't know who the fuck they are. Like I know who they are, I know the name. That's why I put right, it in the fucking fun it. fact. Yeah, but I could. Yeah, you could put a gun to my head. And I could. Like, I don't fucking know. Plus, it's pretty quick. Um, let's talk about someone that that people do recognize, and Snoop. that is um, Snoop Doggy oh, Dog. dog. Uh, he did agree to cameo because members of his family loved the original and that in the movie he freestyled the Christmas rap over the Christmas music because a fucking of course he did. Yeah, that was one of the best parts. I mean, uh, DSM is the best part of this movie, but. Oh, true, true. Yeah, I can't argue with that. Singing debut for actress uh, Haley uh, Steinfeld. Steinfeld posted covers of Flashlight by Jesse J, the song. She sings in the film the same month the film's release um, was signed by uh, Republic Records. So, um, so, yeah. Oh, go ahead. So, the irony here, right? So the irony that this she she is singing a cover of Flashlight, which is what acapella is, is covers. But in the movie, they treat it like an original. It as an, it's uh-huh. an original song that she that her character wrote. Um, that's kind of funny. Mm-hmm. Oh, so um, what are your thoughts on uh, you know, Pitch Perfect two compared to that original? Um, I so just overall general thoughts. I I do not like it as much as Pitch Perfect, which I think is yeah. a general consensus. Um, mm-hmm. I I think that it suffers from a while. I think DSM put on great performances and probably are overall a better foil. 
the wh why do I fucking care about them? I don't. I don't care about them as the bad guy. They're the the <clears throat> the rivalry between the Bellas and the Troubles was better. Plus, you had all of the um the build up tension between Jesse and Becca in the first movie. And while Jesse is in this movie, and you know they've acknowledged they're still together, like that that whole whole dynamic is gone. Mm -hmm. And I just think the the movie lacks from that a little bit. Um, even though, like I said, DSM does some, some, some good stuff. This ended up being my, uh, father's day movie. So I actually, I just finished up watching movies in time for the podcast, but I started way, 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 way early. So, uh, this wasn't exactly the freshest thing, but I did flick through it and kind of brush off my brain about what, um, this one's about first time I saw this was at the Cinnabar in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. Uh, it was freaking freezing cold. It's like not like traditional movie seats. It's more like an elevated seat with like a um, like bar table um, for like the food and stuff. So good food and stuff. Um, you know, you order a few more cocktails out to the movie. Um, so that fun little features. But gosh, it was so cold in there. It's freezing my ass off. Um, so you buy more alcohol to warm yourself up. Oh yeah, well that's the like the thing with going to like a um, a baseball game. Um, if the, the especially if the the seats are like metal bleachers, like you need like at least two beers so you don't feel the, your damn butt anymore and hurting on the steel seat. You, you you do realize they make a thing called stadium seats that are cushions designed for bleachers, right? I don't bring those. No, I don't bring that nonsense. Especially not to like a You're like, I'm just uh, minor league baseball game. <laughs> not drunk. Like, I'm just going to get relaxed. <laughs> All right. So uh, movie opens on performance from the Bellas, who are like three-time reigning national champs at this point. Um, Fat Amy, although uh, kind of spreads this uh, celebration wide open with uh, an eagle view that they uh, – the all the newscasters describe as Muffgate during a uh, little montage. And, hey, there's President Obama. So make you feel kind of old now since he's been out of office for a while. He has been, yeah. Um, in this performance and for, for him and Michelle and everybody else. But, yeah, and then it's all over <laughs> – all over the news and the talk shows and they're, you know, using actual news and talk show, like real shit. So, um, yeah. And they get, um, they get basically banned and can't compete for, to, to defend their, their national title and they can't get any new members mm -hmm. and yeah, probation. Cl yeah. Uh, Brittany snow finds, uh, they should have called it super, sensor. they should have called it super secret probation. That could have like made it. A little more funny. Go ahead. Uh, Brittany Snow's character, Chloe, finds a loophole that lets them still compete for worlds, which kind of comes out of nowhere. Never mentioned in the first movie, because mm -hmm. obviously they probably weren't planning a sequel. But um, <laughs> And so basically she's like, if we win worlds, can we be reinstated? And um, Elizabeth yeah. Banks' character is like, Mm -hmm. He's like, yeah, but no American team's ever won because they fucking hate us. So uh, good luck. Oh, and you're being replaced by this German team on your promotional tour or whatever, um, which we come to find out later is DOS Sound Machine, uh, a.k.a. DSM. Quite amusing. All the different places, the uh, acapella, you know, color commentary and announcers uh, show up, even at this, like the practices and weird performances yeah so because forth. they're they're doing like a podcast about the bella's redemption arc oh oh yeah that's there. right <laughs> yeah goodness totally totally forgot about that but that makes a lot of sense oh troublemakers livening things up with that uh lollipop romance song at the um basically like the freshman orientation performance i guess yes and they were the pride of Barden, even though, you know, they have not won the title in a few years. And the, the, the Bellas are the big deal, but this is at the same time the Bellas are in their super secret probation, probation hearing or whatever. <laughs> yeah, super secret probation. Super serial probation. This time Becca is getting distracted with a uh, music producer internship. You know, we get that little shot of her making a bunch of coffee. Um, and Key is in this um, from Key and Peel, having a... Good time making fun of people. 
for not being smart. Yeah, he he's the one guy. The he just lays into the one guy over and over and over. Peg from Married with Children's in this, and she's uh, Bella, and that means her daughter's a legacy. Hey, go Greek system turn. I like that you went with the oldest possible reference for Katie Seagal instead of you know Sons of Anarchy or Futurama. Well, I'm aware. I, I am aware that she's in Sons of Anarchy, but that did not come immediately to mind. No, Married with Children definitely. Oh, come on. Hey, Peg! Oh, the Bellas check out Slave their uh, tour replacements. Dawson machine at the... Isn't it like a Volkswagen-like showcase? So, of course, they used a German acapella group yeah. to do that. So, <laughs> actually, actually, I guess I could have included this in the fun fact. So, um, Commissar, who is the blonde girl that Becca fawns over the, the whole time, the, the leader of DSM, is actually not German. She's Dutch. Okay. Um... But the second leader, the taller male guy, uh-huh. um, Meshert, Meshert man. Yes, he has, and he has a, a name. But he's actually like a pretty famous DJ, uh-huh. and had a very popular YouTube channel, according to uh, Letterbox, which is, I guess, according to IMDb. Um, <laughs> but it's from, you know, it hasn't been updated in years, so I don't know if that's still true. But at the time of the movie coming out, apparently he was a very like a pretty famous YouTube person. So. Yeah, I like how they use a lot more of like what you're used to hearing from like the pentatonics where like the different, uh, it's not just straight up singing. It's like doing like sound effects and like beats and stuff to the, to the performances, which is a little bit more complex than, you know, what we saw from the Yeah, which they really the only did that in the, the, in the first one. It was really only the trebles. Um, Mm-hmm. And a little bit, they did it a little bit, but not a lot in the first one. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, Becca mixing up with Snoop, um, as we mentioned in the uh, the fun facts there. Yeah. That. Uh, yep. She's the good the mesh ups. That's what she does. Yes. Is David Cross hosting a super secret invite only acapella showdown? The best part of the movie. That's pretty good. Because especially when you get to the end and it's like, like, I don't know, that whole kind of situation is really good because you, you get Benji, who's starting to fall for Haley Steinfeld's character, and they're doing songs about butts and they're doing Baby Got Back. And then he starts talking about taking her to a nice breakfast. So they get kicked out for that. And then we get <laughs> Country Love uh-huh. and you get... um you get Becca like acting like she's gonna punch the guy. That's the same guy she punched in the first one, and you got Clay Matthews being like, "I'm the one who knows about country love. No one's been hurt the way I have." It. And they come to them, and he's like, "Man, we got fucking nothing." And they get so they're gone, and it, you know, he was like, "I'm just thinking about this forty-two thousand dollar gift card." <laughs> the bus, Dave and Buster's. <laughs> Dave and Buster's the D and B's, and then it comes down to. I know you want it, Clay Matthews. <laughs> He calls him by his like his whole fucking Christian name. It's like four names, um, and then it, it comes down to DSM and, and the Bellas, and uh, it's like '90s hip hop jams. And so you got like Bill Dev DeVoe, that girl is Poison, and they're going back and forth. And then we get flashlight, and um, you know DSM wins. They get the gift card, and then um, then there's kind of just like a party. So, Reggie Watts is a drummer, right? You know what I'm talking about? Uh, Do with the fro. Uh, I... The who's on like the uh, older team? Actually, uh, I do know who you're talking about. I know. I mean, I can picture him in my head, but I I don't know. Yeah, hmm. this guy it says he's an American comedian and actor. Hmm beatboxer and musician his improvised musical sets i have to click on it using only his voice keyboard and looping machine he refers to himself as a disinformationist who aims to disorient his audience in a comedic fashion well it makes okay. quite a bit of sense that he's and, in this and, movie then <laughs> and then he also led the house band for the late late show with james corden that's um, that's what I know him from. Okay, because whenever I first saw him, I was like, "Isn't that Questlove?" Which was like the Roots drummer for Jimmy Fallon. So okay, 
That's right, I got the little mix yeah. up. Cool. Yeah, apparently he was born in West Germany in oh. 1972. Should have been on Das Sound Machine. Uh, Das Sound Machine, yeah. Um, so, totally okay, fun. that's... But yeah, James Corden also feels like a person that should be should, would, would have been in these movies. Was he in the third one? Maybe. I don't remember. It's been... Forgot that David Cross was anyway. in there. But not that really has much difference because he didn't like sing. Um, it's I hair. I totally forgot about the bumper and fat Amy uh, date scene. Guess I must have wiped that from my memory. Um, disastrous world practice Reasonable. with the uh, them doing like circus stunts and pyrotechnics, reminiscent to the old uh, what, Pepsi Michael Jackson commercial, like where like he caught on fire. I mean, yeah, I didn't think about that until I saw it here. Although, I mean, it was essentially a practice, but it was a performance at what, like an old person's home or something. Yeah, and, that was really bizarre. And the yeah. announcers are there. It's like, what, what's going on here? Yeah, they are definitely not in sync <laughs> at that point with their weird 90s, like, blonde hair. Uh, Haley Steinfeld's cute they relationship got, with uh, the nerd guy. Ruin from the, the world beginning. tour. Yeah, Benji. Um, let's see here. I was just, yeah, when I was watching the movie, I was like, man, this movie would probably be better with Anna Camp. And they go to her, like, summer camp retreat place where they do a bunch of summer camp fun montage scenes mixed with more singing. Yay, bear singing. And, 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 and bear traps. Oh, yes. Yes, those sprung up and were, I guess, the punchy humor of that moment. Um, also, because I have been watching... I've watched both Pitch Perfects and have been watching True Blood. I have seen a lot of Anna Camp in the last month, and I'm okay with that. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. Good stuff. Um, tons of bonding in this movie. As I was flipping through, I was like, there's so many scenes where like, they're just like sitting around singing, which, you know, is pleasant. Or sitting around bonding. It's like, I don't remember any of this. So, I guess, I mean, I guess it's character building, but maybe just filler at the same time. What say you? I mean, I think it's supposed to, you know, they're they're trying to embrace this time they have left together before they kind of graduate, and you know, I guess trying to play that part up emotionally, um, for it. So, so whenever I saw Fat Amy singing on a canoe in the middle of a lake, I'm thinking there should be a joke here where they can't hear her, but no, it's it's loud and proud and. <laughs> the the, um, the joke period. was is like, why didn't she just walk around? the lake because the, the the bellas are like why didn't she just walk walk around the lake mm -hmm. so um also uh, i i have come to find out that fat amy who uh rebel wilson there there's her real name mm -hmm. she only plays fat amy like i watched another movie called hustle with fat amy and anne hathaway um mm -hmm. don't watch it it's it it you think it's going to be this really cool movie with Anne Hathaway and Fat Amy, and it is not, and it's um, it was also pretty disappointing. But um, I've come to find out that Rebel Wilson just plays Fat Amy in all of her movies, just at least the ones I've seen. She's pretty interesting in Jojo Rabbit. She's still Rebel Wilson, but um, she's... oh, I haven't, I have seen that. It's but yeah, it's been a minute, but I, I did see that, but. I was, I was there because of a different blonde who was in that movie. Yeah, I had pretty much totally forgot about Fat Amy in this just because she doesn't really jump off the screen just because she's doing this whole bumper relationship thing. Um, but whenever they go to Denmark, yeah, she's that's a getting... lot of fun. Uh, yeah, I mean, they... Um, had that snazzy, like, going to Denmark map and thing, and then it looks like Umbrellas under uh, umbrellas of Schurgborg there for a moment as uh, we get a nice Danish rainbow i think it was or just a really nice um sunny day so what'd you think of dsm's performance there at the end it's awesome it's but yeah probably the best part of the movie all the uh dsm stuff i mean that la that lead lady she's pretty 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 hot and um yeah they're pretty talented um, I... and it kind of seems like they should have won uh, yes, yeah, so they them doing Fall Out Boy, um, oh, which is right. the main song, and then they and when this movie came out, I would I did not know that it was a Fall Out Boy song. I actually had just kind of discovered that song or 
like myself within the last months and it's like on my current like major playlist i love that song so that was cool Mm -hmm. um also uh anna kendrick all of the like disses that were like basically her fawning over commissar Mm -hmm. or yeah yeah commissar um she made up on the fly so okay uh, yeah, she made them. She made them. She made them up on the fly. They were all ad libbed. <laughs> um, yeah, I definitely liked their performance. Oh, and I definitely think they should have won over the Bellas. Mm-hmm. It was like the Bellas. The whole movie. It's we we do we don't do covers. We do or we don't do originals. We do covers. And the mm-hmm. Americans have never won. And now the Americans are supposed to win by breaking protocol. And like. I don't know. To me, that didn't make any sense. So, <laughs> other than... Aka yeah, what? The good guys. Aka, excuse me? Like, I like the stripped-down nature of the beginning of the performance with, like, the clapping and stuff. And then, then bringing... Like, the, they have, like, a line early in the movie where they say that, like, oh, there's just two... There's so much... There's so many more of them than us. So, like, it kind of foreshadows how they bring back the alumni for the final thing there. So, that's all pretty charming. And it, Makes it somewhat believable that, you know, they won. But, um, what do I really think of this movie? So, um, it's definitely not as, like, funny as the first one with, like, how, like, crazy the, um, some of the humor was there. Um, the set piece of Anna Kendrick, you know, doing the, the cup thing is, like, like, iconic from the first one, whereas there's nothing that really stands out too much other than you know it's cool it's it's more of a competition throughout but at the same time there's just not as much good stuff to hook on to yeah i I agree um like star rating like i had given it a four star you know just when i was setting up letterbox and like i kept it there i was just like you know what's the i watched four movies and that was the last movie of the day um sunday and so I was like, you know what? I'm probably just tired. Like, so I'm not going to like downgrade it, but it's definitely, it definitely doesn't like have those moments like outside of DSM, like DSM is easily the best part of the movie. So yeah, well, obviously give it a three. Kendrick, but I mean, that's fair. I think it's, I think it's a little better than above average, but maybe, maybe eight, you know, a four, which would be an eight is a little high. But like I said, I wasn't going to downgrade it off of me basically being, fatigued having watched four movies in a day so all right let's get to our second feature dursu elizawa this is my pick as one of my movies that um i really like or my favorite yeah whatever um so it's a 1975 soviet japanese biographical adventure drama film directed and co-written by akira kurosawa his only non-Japanese language film, and his first one in 70 millimeter. Pretty cool. Uh, the film is based on the 1923 um, memoir Dorsu Elazal, which was the name, which was named after the native trapper by Russian explorer Vladimir Arsenyev about his exploration of the Skyhoti Allen, Skyhot Allen Siberia. Region. Yeah, basically. Uh, Far east over the course of uh, multiple expeditions in the early early 20th century. Cool. All right. So Kirikosawa um, had hoped to make this film in the 50s, but had trouble adapting the story to Japanese setting, never thinking that one day he could actually do it in Russia. (sighs) Fate, I guess. Um... To make the tiger attack more realistic, a wild one was used instead of a domesticated animal. Needless to say, it was not collaborative, um, wasn't cooperative or whatever. Um, yeah, not surprising there, I suppose. <sighs> um, mm-hmm. It became the highest grossing Soviet film at the time of its release. Mm-hmm. Uh, this mo- this movie earned Kurosawa his only Oscar, which was best foreign language film for the Soviet Union. Yeah, it's crazy that this is the movie that that got him that, and not some of the other ones that got nominated. But here we are. You never know in the cycle. Um, the film is based yeah. on. Oh, we just read that, didn't we? Okay. Um, 
The production lasted three years, and of course, Kurosawa did this film in the USSR because no Japanese student uh, studio wanted to fund, fund him. I think um, after Dzeskadan, which yeah, that we did um, on the cast, uh, he had a Back period. Back in season one. Yeah, that sounds right. Um, yeah. Yeah, he got quite depressed, and I think that movie was a flop, and he almost uh, killed himself. So, uh, good thing that did not happen. Yeah. And we get light period Kurosawa, which... Um... It... Go ahead. And it, it, it flopped, but it was uh, when I was looking up, trying to just look up stuff other than just, hey, fun facts. Uh, I was trying to look mm -hmm. up how many awards Kurosawa had won, and I saw that that movie was nominated for Best Foreign Language Picture. But, you know, that doesn't necessarily equate to um, commercial success. And at that point, we, we hit this point where his movie started coming like every five years. It went from like 65 to 70 and then 75 to 80 and then 85 and then 90. And then I also found out there were two movies after Dreams, which I did not know. So... So I found out about this early on. So one of the original like amateur like not well i mean a lot of the youtube um movie podcasters or uh youtube folks that do like reviews and like physical media things like early on i found this guy and um he had a really interesting series where he was going through like uh the movies you have to watch before you die and so forth and i'm not sure if this was on that list but at some point yeah he's really into kurosawa and so he had uh, uncovered this movie and was talking all about it. And um, so this was a, a Criterion Laserdisc back in the day. I don't think it's um, been re-released at this point. So um, pretty unfortunate. But uh, yeah, he talked it up big time. He uh, uh, he mentioned the Capitan Thursu thing. So um, something about that really sounded charming. So I wanted to get to it sooner than later. And gosh seen it several years ago now and brought it brought it back for uh, you to check out so you as a kurosawa fan how would you think about coming in throughout and coming out all right well first of all it does have a blu-ray printing from imprint which you can uh -huh. get on diabolic and let me double check this real quick uh it showed it being announced at the end of last year that it was getting a 4K, but I can't seem to verify that here where I just clicked. So, but I definitely mm -hmm. thought I had seen that it had gotten a 4K um, somewhere. But anyway, to answer your question, um, so I didn't really know anything about this um, story. About this one, yeah. Um, you know, I have watched uh, over the last six or seven years. I mean, I've watched a good amount of Kurosawa films. Like, I mean, I guess I could have blown through all the big ones in like a month if I had wanted to, but kind of spacing them out, watching a couple here and there. Um, but this one wasn't, I was super familiar with until you brought it up, um, at the end of the last podcast. And I did, I was definitely intrigued that, you know, he did this in Russia. And I feel like once I saw it and was like, Oh, this was the one he did in Russia. I feel like I knew that he had, had some issues at one point getting movies made in Japan. I didn't mm -hmm. remember specifically that it was after Dedeskadin, but we probably talked about that when we did Dedeskadin, I would imagine, or we talked about it coming out of Dedeskadin going, I guess maybe when we did, did we do Kajamusha or we just, I think I gave you Kagamusha for a present. And I think you talked about it at one point. Yeah. And I, mean, I know we did ran, um, so I like I knew that he had did that and I guess I'd kind of just forgotten about it. But no, this movie is absolutely stunning, especially in the first half of the movie um, in the 1901 or 1903, the 1903 section mm -hmm. um, where they're in they're in the taiga in the winter for the most like the whole time is okay. some crazy, amazing, gorgeous shots because, of course, they are because it's Kurosawa. <laughs> and that's what the fuck he does. Um, did the also, um, did the version you watched on Criterion Channel? Did it kind of have like inconsistent like the, the coloring kind of waver at points? Not that I recall. The only thing I remember really thinking was fishy was sometimes the sub seemed a little wrong, but only for really for Dursu. And so I, me and Carl were thinking maybe that was done intentionally to make it you know sound like 
he was speaking maybe more in like broken Russian kind of. Hmm. Um, yeah, because it would just um, oddly enough, it would they would be out of order. So instead of you know saying I will do this, it would almost be the Yoda do this I will, except for it would be like yeah um it just wouldn't necessarily be as clean as that it would still be like kind of broken um but i don't remember any fluctuation with the coloration but i might have just missed it i mean i'm sure it's been restored it looked pretty good okay um i mean cool. it, yeah i mean I think... it looks like it's 50 years old so i mean i mean but yeah i i was watching an old digital copy so yeah i'm not sure quite what that relates to what's on uh, the channel so interesting um yeah so these uh russian guys go out into the woods they're uh, pretty cheerful singing songs and stuff and man this uh the score the music in this movie especially in the first like quarter was very in your face and like pronounced but it kind of seemed like it settled down after that point this movie it was a very familiar glass of milk very satisfying but not spectacular Maybe that I'm getting ahead of myself with my um, my final thoughts, but yep, dish that out at this point. Um, yep, I already talked about need some more snazzy uh, physical media. That'd be appreciated. Um, okay, so yeah, these uh, Russian soldiers are si um, surveying the Siberian wilderness, and a funny little man who's savvy in the outdoors comes and crashes their party, milks, makes himself at home, and charms them pretty much all instantly. Yeah, they all just basically befriend him immediately, especially El Capitan. Um, and, you know, they one of the themes of this movie is just their organic friendship. It's kind of the main driving point of the of of the movie. Um, For being Kurosawa, he's definitely more upfront with his themes, I felt, in this one. It's very much sewn into the dialogue firmly with instead of being like more understated in some of his other stuff but um obviously themes of protecting nature and conservation uh pop up in this and also the ultimate theme of like a modernized society eventually um overpowering you know those that are you know one with nature so oh yeah and, for, and for age, sure too, i mean for... there's yeah, and you know, not being able to see, and you know, just all of that. It's and it's 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 not hidden, like you said. It is very. I don't want to say it's in your face because that makes it sound like it's overbearing, but it's it's definitely just laid out on Front Street, like it's yeah. right there. Um, I mean, especially There's... like I was going to say, especially once you get to like say the end, um, and and Dursu has like come to live in the village because he can't see, which means he can't shoot. Mm -hmm. Um, and he can't adjust to living that life. Um, Carl even said it while we were watching the movie and then put it in his review that it, it reminded him of Brooks from Shawshank Redemption, um, where he got out of prison and could not adjust to, to the, to the, the new bustling modern life essentially, um, or being, you know, different from where you're used to living kind of thing. And I can totally uh concur and agree with that that's a pretty spot on comparison um yeah definitely a kind of a series of set pieces laced together with nature porn maybe that's the best way to oh yeah there's a lot of nature porn for <laughs> sure especially <laughs> the the one shot the sun and the the, the rising moon and the setting mm -hmm. sun um i mean as soon as it popped on the screen i was like star wars like it was mm -hmm. literally the first thing just Star Wars. I mean, it's that shot is the same shot from what Tatooine, I think, in the first one. Like, it's and the shot is so freaking gorgeous. Which again, that's what Kurosawa does. He he gives you just this um these amazing framed fucking shots that like you could you could start a Kurosawa movie and not show any of the credits where you know it's you know it's got Kurosawa his name attached to it and you will know it's a Kurosawa movie by the way he frames the fucking wilderness and the shots and mm -hmm. 
You well, know, it's so unique in this one because you know we're used to him like framing up like uh, Shogun and samurai and stuff, and now he's it's doing it in you know Russia with Russian soldiers and stuff. This is like oh, this is Tarkovsky kind of stuff, but no, it's Kurosawa. All right, yeah, um, yeah, definitely an early on great set piece is him showing that he's a hell of a shot. He's not even going to waste the bottle. He's just going to cut the rope with the with the gun. Um, Dorsu, uh, he warned the captain not to go out on that frozen lake. He warned him a couple times, but um, no, he went on with Capitan's uh, desires. And yeah, the um, blizzard that, kicks in. Mm-hmm. Yet that scene is frantic with them just cutting the grass. Or pull, yeah, having a, yeah, just having to yank it up as quick well, they as they were can. Using, I mean, they were, they were they were cutting it. I mean, they said cut. Okay. They were using knives, but yeah, or um, just getting it up as much as they could to mm-hmm. to make like a makeshift shelter, and then like the captain passes as far out. as they get out on like a, sh- a whole sheet of ice, which they would have had no protection. But then they get get back, I guess, just to the shore, and are able to rip up all like these reeds and make this like um basically reed igloo. Make a tauntaun. <laughs> it took, it took me a second on that one thank you <laughs> oh yeah i guess that does tie into uh, empire strikes back in a way fascinating um amazing scene of them rushing around to build the shelter i mean capitan's like passing out every few seconds like capitan hurry up hurry up help help work work capitan so um but yeah that's definitely has to be the most iconic line from the movie capitan Capitan. <laughs> um, um. So yeah, after that, he uh, they find the railroad tracks, and uh, I guess Dursu has led them back to civilization. So they split up for you know a hot minute. But play is like thirty seconds or something. Movie time. <laughs> yeah. Say again. No oh, just saying. Just they're apart. We're like, oh, there's this this grand goodbye, and then intermission and then oh where's Dursu? oh there he is you know i mean yeah, i guess like because now it's with the friendship theme it makes sense that they're connected right back together but um you know you wish you there would have been a little bit more longing built in here <laughs> which i mean i guess also there is an actual like time gap so the the longing is there it's just that it's not necessarily expressed in the movie but because they mm-hmm. go from what it goes from what 1903 to 1907 or 1909 or something. I don't remember the years, but it's like a so, five or six year gap or something. So in the second part, we hear about the murderous Chinese um, who, I guess, come up with uh, cheap ways of hunting animals and slaughtering people. So not happy with that. Uh, the tiger is more involved here. I think Dursu calls it with the Alba. And um, the Abba, yeah, I guess it's kind of a metaphor for like Dursu's like creeping um, old age, kind of overcoming him in the form of this cool tiger. Um, not quite as exciting as I remember, but you know, it's a tiger. Nothing. Look, just just because you hate tigers, <laughs> fucking chicken lover <laughs> doesn't mean you have to be a hater. Uh, surviving the elements from the river to the cold the storms yeah they all they all do it together them band of Russians yeah the, the river soon. yeah another frantic scene with them getting the axes to like cut down the tree to get it into the water to save Darsu mm-hmm. um, because the, the river was calm and they were trying to get off the raft and then the raft takes them away and so yeah that was I mean, I figured he was, you know, he was really adept at traversing the taiga. He could, he could have done the whitewater rafting. It would, it seems like it would have been fine, except for, you know, the <laughs> raft got destroyed in the rapids. But, you know, mm-hmm. so heavy. Um, yeah, and already by this part, we get to the part where his uh, eyesight starts diminishing after he, um, he shoots and scares the tiger, but he's like, he thinks that he hit it. And it wounded it, right? Yes. He thinks that he hit it and wounded I guess that is... I I thought he kind of shot in the air. 
yeah. not even towards it. Mm-hmm. But um, I guess maybe that's open for interpretation if he hit it or not, because you never they never really go back up to it other than him talking about how it's cursed him. Because mm-hmm. then he can't he can't hit. Um, they they're looking for a they see a stag, and he just fucking just misses and misses and misses. And then right. there's a scene where he he puts the bottle back up and he tries to shoot it and he or a target and he can and he gets closer. Yeah, he, he and closer. hangs like a glove or something up by like a, a yeah. knife on the tree. That was pretty cool. But yeah, it's very uh, prolonged and um, kind of excruciating that. You know, the, the Dursu that we knew at the beginning is, is no more. Um, gosh, this movie flies by. Um, I guess this is a movie that felt very familiar the second time around. I pretty much remembered every set piece. So um, it really flowed through really quick all over again. I mean, it was still comforting. It's just, you know, whenever you watch a movie where you really, really enjoy it the first time, but since like you're familiar with it, it's not quite as exciting the second time around. Yeah, I mean that happens. I think with a lot of movies, especially like when you when you know what's going to happen, because mm-hmm. um, I mean th- it also felt like you were going to get, you know, either a showdown with the tiger or you you were going to get some big kind of showdown with something that you don't really get, I guess, other than the town. Um, mm-hmm. And then this, and, yeah, this, you know, this you ending see, is it's fairly flat. I mean, it it feels so rushed on a second look with with him being there him like complaining about you know being all cooped up complaining about the weapon then to him getting in trouble then him saying he wants to leave and then he dies off screen and i had forgotten he was yeah and you, um yeah and you get this um you, know, you get the scene where he's like yelling at the the water guy you know for for being a bad man for charging for water but it's like bro right. you trade sable pelts like you're you're doing the same thing. You're going out and doing something someone else can do and, and profiting mm-hmm. from it. Now maybe you're not profiting with literal money, like you're trading the spelt for food directly. But like mm-hmm. these people are in town, they are they are paying for the service of this dude bringing the water kind of thing. But and that's yeah, now that that's you mention it, in like, like my- Dursu as like this grumpy old man character um, is really portrayed well. As uh, you know, he gets pissed um, off about this and then that. And go ahead, sorry. But but um, he really it does he does really seem like like he appreciates the captain and his family for what they've done for him and like he loves the like the little captain and the little captain obviously loves him. But yeah, he just it's not a life that he can sustain. He can't do it. It's the like you said modernization, and he is not a modern person. Um, by by any means and he just wants to go back um back out into the wild and the captain gives him this really nice gun with new sights it's like the latest model and Mm -hmm. um because he had gift him with um, weapons before and i think he was always real touched about that yeah and you know he's they say he's murdered because you know he goes down there and he's like oh he doesn't have the gun and it would make a lot of sense that a thief stole it and killed him for it and you know he he's so kind-hearted he probably didn't realize it, it was anyways. a fight yeah yeah probably yeah um huh. but yeah it, it's 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 kind of like you said it, it I don't want to say the same thing where you say it falls flat, but you know, it's, it's that thing where he dies off screen and then they're just unceremoniously throwing him in between the two big trees that he, that, uh, the captain mentions at the beginning, but it, it's that, uh-huh. so... you know, where it's that, uh, it, it really hits home with that. You know, that's where we're all going to be. We're all going to be uh-huh. Uh-huh. in the kind dirt. Like you know? it, yeah. Kind of like I'm a yeah, and, and you're always, maybe you don't get the ending you're supposed to get or you know that that kind of thing and you know the the fragile the fragility mm-hmm. of of man kind of thing so um i mean this <laughs> ooh look at you being pompous <laughs> pompous the fragility of man ah yes ah on the way well, we, we are we are talking about a, a criterion so I must assume, oh i, I, yeah, I totally quite. missed the opportunity to talk about inside out too and the fact that they use, they have on way in there which they describe as boredom which isn't quite accurate but 
Yeah, it's close enough. I still need kids. to. I still need to see Inside Out too. I loved Inside Out. It's like one of my favorite Disney Pixar movies. So I, I still need to get around to watching that. But it'll probably be once it's out of theaters. So I guess why I like this movie so much is it's kind of a Boy Scout movie. Um, where I you mean, know it's... yeah, to a de- to a degree, yeah. Yeah, I mean they're out camping the whole time, wilderness survival, um, dealing with wildlife and stuff. It yeah, it definitely I guess um, melds well to my uh, Boy Scout heart. So um, I guess at that level, because yeah, I do remember after I first saw it, I recommended it to my uh, my buddy John, um, who was in Scouts with me, and I don't think he ever checked it out. But I'm glad I finally shared it with you. And uh, as a Kurosawa fan, you're much obliged. Yes, sir. So it's the verdict time. Yeah. I was charmed by, um, yeah, definitely a charming film. Great pacing. It's just, gosh, I, it's it's almost like I want Dursu too, but obviously that can't happen because he's dead. But, um, really nice to revisit, uh, definitely maybe in 10 years on a 4K. Can't wait. I mean, by then it's probably like eight or sixteen k, but yes, um, <laughs> um, yeah, four four stars. Like I, I put it ahead on my yearly rating and my Kurosawa rating of Dreams, but even though I gave Dreams a five star, um, and it's just that thing where the movie is really good. It has a much better like narrative story than Dreams, but like I kind of. It didn't go, when it finished. I didn't go. This is a five star movie. Where when Dreams ended, I went. This is five stars. And so like that's kind of how I make that um, discrepancy there. But yeah, it's um, mm-hmm. it is a fantastic movie. And I think if you have the Criterion Channel, um, you should definitely check it out. Um, and if you have it on Laserdisc, you should like mail it to me, um, so I can I can have that. But um. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's a great, it's a great, it's a great movie, um, and definitely, I think, especially if you're a Coruscant fan and haven't seen it, you should definitely, definitely check it out. First time I rated it a four and a half, and so there, probably the the fact that the the ending probably dragged it a little bit down for me, so it wasn't that five stars, but um, on a rewatch, a little, a little lower, four stars. All right, All right. So, what's coming up next? You want me to go first? Sure, you can go first. All right. So we're back in the hate category, which we're gonna take oh, a God much, much different um, peek into this. Okay. So, kind of a gimmick here. Um, this is the movie, the first movie I saw in the movie theater that I came out and I said. I don't like that. So we're going to watch We're Back, A Dinosaur Story, produced by Steven Spielberg. John Goodman is the voice of a dinosaur. Yay. Is this connected to any other dinosaur movies? Is this, I assume this is from like the late 80s, early 90s? This is an early 90s, uh, um, yeah, uh, animated film. Think Oliver and okay. Company, but with dinosaurs. Okay, and this isn't connected to a franchise or anything. Mm-mm. Standalone. I, I think it's a Warner, but um, I rewatched it right before my the Letterbox era with my kids, and I think I got a little bit more appreciation out of what they're aiming for. It just it kind of takes kind of a a dark angle, so um, it's quite the contrast, and I guess I can see how a young me, um. Why am I already analyze, reanalyzing this movie? We're going to watch We're Back, A Dinosaur Story, a PG movie for is this, this uh, podcast. Go ahead. Um, and you said this was the first movie you saw in theater? No, not. This was the first one I saw in theater that I didn't like. Okay. That I consciously like went out of the theater and was like, God, that was a waste of time. <laughs> Damn. Okay. Well, 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 I have went the complete and utter opposite direction. Okay. Maybe I'll have my kids on for um, the, we're back. Who knows? 
You could. You could. I don't think that your wife would appreciate you having them on for the movie that I'm about to reveal. Ooh, building it up. Uh, yeah. So, uh, do you do, do you want to take? You, you remember the quote from the beginning of the episode, right? Are we watching an X Men movie? We are not watching an X Men movie. Hooray! But who said? We're watching Deadpool. Who, <laughs> no, that's an X Man movie. <laughs> Okay. No, what what actor said that line? Um, Patrick Stewart or uh, Ian nope. McKellen? Nope. We, we're oh, we're oh, 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 Fassbender. We're not. Say Fassbender. What? It's Fassbender, right? Yes, Michael Michael Fassbender. Yes. Okay. So it's it's a movie starring Michael Fassbender. Although I guess he doesn't really star in this movie, he's just in this movie. Oh, so it's it's not his. Uh, it's not that crazy one. Uh, shame. I think that's what it's called. No, I would not. Oh, I've already watched. No, no, no. Not, not a sex obsession movie pick for you. Okay. Uh, Michael Fassbender. Uh... No, I didn't watch Shame. I watched Hunger. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, I can just. I too. can just. I can just. It's. Inglorious yeah. Bastards. Oh, cool. All right. <laughs> I want my scalps, Ooh. motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I think that miss. Oh, will this be the final um, piece of the puzzle for watching movies associated with our theme song? We've done will Clockwork Orange. We've done Boondock Saints. We've pretty much done Kill Bill. We've done we, Clockwork yeah, we... Orange. But we haven't done um, Inglorious Bastards. But we've done Pulp Fiction. Yeah, it it was almost not Inglorious Bastards. It was almost Jackie Brown. It was almost ho- not Hollywood. Um, hateful. Hateful. And I, I don't know. Like, yeah. And then I was just sitting there, and I I did I did the three. And I was like, you never. Well, yep, there it is. It's Inglorious Bastards. So I think you would tease doing that, like back in season two or something. And I'm glad it's about. It's this is about the right time. <laughs> it, it's about damn <laughs> time. I did. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it just this just might be my masterpiece. As we talk about this strange little kids movie that I'm making us both watch, which will be a new form of. I mean. This Test. this mm-hmm. is why I liked when we had themes and we could do we did a kids movie or an animated movie theme and we did all that we could have themes because I could have picked like a kid movie or an animated movie or something but nah now we're gonna have this ridiculous not even juxtaposition just complete opposite ends of the spectrum <laughs> with we're back a dinosaur story and inglorious fucking bastards let's go. That's why I guess we're the Average Joe's Movie Club cast. Um, if you want to send us any questions, that email is at the bottom of the YouTube video, the Average Joe's Movie Club cast at gmail.com. So, Joey, why do we do this show? Because we love talking about movies, and I love making you flip me off. <laughs> Later.